There were two more murders 15 miles away. When police arrived, they found the telephones and electricity lines. We have a weird homicide. The scene described by one investigator is reminiscent of a weird... When someone you love gets sick, you'll do anything to see them well again. And sometimes that means surrendering control to those who are qualified to diagnose and treat your loved one. On August 20th, 1951, a woman died behind bars after years of tending to deathbeds. Deathbeds she helped people's loved ones approach a little quicker than usual. So if you like your coffee hot, but your bones chilled, sit back and start your day with a morning cup of murder. Bertha Alice Williams was born on October 30th, 1871 in Morse Mill, Missouri to a father, William, mother, Matilda, and eventually nine other siblings. By the time Bertha was in her teens, she was already being hailed as one of the prettiest girls in Jefferson County. But when she was 22 years old, she set her sights on a man named Henry Graham, and the two were married, later welcoming a daughter named Lila. Unfortunately, this marriage was doomed when, after about 10 years together, rumors that Henry was carrying on an affair started to spread far and wide. But Bertha didn't let her husband's infidelity slow her down and quickly started an affair of her own with a young man named Eugene Gifford. Eugene was 10 years younger than Bertha and quickly fell under the spell of his new lover, breaking off an engagement with a girl a little closer to his age. Just as things in the love department started to get messy for Bertha, Henry suddenly became sick and died of what doctors diagnosed as pneumonia. Bertha, who went through a respectable mourning period for her first husband, was ready to start over and, in 1907, married Eugene and moved to Catawissa in hopes of distancing herself from the Morse Mill gossip. Eugene seemed to thrive in Catawissa, becoming a pretty successful farmer in the Big Bend area while Bertha, wanting to help in any way she could, started cooking for his hired hands, becoming known for her delicious meals. She also became known as a county nurse of sorts, caring for neighbors and earning herself quite the favorable reputation. It seemed like life for the Giffords was going perfectly. By this point, they had welcomed a son, James. Both seemed pretty successful and both were well-respected and both were well-respected and well-liked members of their small community. In fact, Bertha, still as beautiful as ever, was so well-respected that no one seemed to notice when a large number of her patients violently died with what they were calling gastritis. They also didn't seem to notice how badly the Giffords barn was infested with rats. Or at least, that's what her story was. Because if they had, they may have noticed the large amounts of arsenic Bertha bought as a treatment. No, all they saw was Bertha, for the past 16 years, jump into action at a moment's notice and eagerly sit by the bedsides of any and all the sick members of her community. Caring for not just the patients, but their entire household, ordering people in and out of the sick room and making calls that impressed even the most worried family members. Nothing stopped this good Samaritan, and she once trudged through a blizzard to care for an ailing patient. They didn't even seem to care that she wasn't a trained nurse. All they saw was a good-hearted woman willing to help anyone and swallowed back whatever tonic or relief she prescribed. For years, she tended to the ill, making their last months on earth as comfortable as she could. And her favorite patients to care for? Children. Trusting, harmless, unknowing children with her parents who were so desperate for her cure. Time and time again, she would order everyone out of the sick room with promises to care for the child throughout the night, securing hours of unwatched time with her patient. The next morning, she would rouse the family from their sleep or phone the doctor. But by the time he arrived, the child would be far too ill to recover nor to tell their parents that their doting nurse was to blame. Their parents would lay their child to rest, comforted by the fact that their sick child spent the last hours of their lives with a caring nurse who wept alongside them at the funerals, missing only one over the course of 18 years and even going as far as to pay for the embalming of one of her victims. And on the off chance the patients started to recover, Bertha simply administered her secret weapon, rat poison. Now, it didn't necessarily go unnoticed. In fact, some of the women in the area commented on Bertha's track record with her patients, with one saying she, quote, plunks herself down in a sick room, the patient never gets well. But the men in the area wrote off their suspicions, not putting two and two together until Ed Brindley passed away, the ninth patient to die inside of her home. They demanded answers, and police were brought in to investigate an indignant Bertha Gifford, who explained each and every single death to ever take place on her watch, acute gastritis. And police were inclined to believe her until Dr. James Stewart, the state health commissioner, obtained drugstore records, all from neighboring towns, that showed Bertha as a very frequent buyer of arsenic-based rat poison which, according to the doctor, has very similar symptoms to gastritis. The investigation would later turn up a total of 15 deaths with which Bertha was suspected, three of which they could prove indefinitely, and she was arrested on August 25, 1928. After her arrest, and as the trial began, a clear picture of what exactly Bertha had been doing over the years started to make itself known. It all started back in 1909, when Henry Graham, a seemingly healthy man, died suddenly of cramps before a doctor could arrive. Then there was her mother-in-law, Emily Gifford, who, despite Bertha's best efforts, died in 1913 of a very similar ailment. Then there was her 13-year-old brother-in-law, James, who passed out in her arms the next year only to die of severe stomach cramps and vomiting. 
In front of a grand jury, a man named George Stolfelder told how this ministering angel nursed all three of his children, 15-month-old Bernard, two-year-old Margaret, and seven-year-old Irene, who all later died of acute gastritis. While another parent, Mr. George Shamel, who worked for the Giffords for quite some time, told of two sons who died just two days after a visit to the Gifford house. A month after the second son died, Bertha donned her nurse's uniform and, once again, rushed to the bedside of Leona Slocum, a woman dying of tuberculosis, and the sister of George Shamel. Leona soon rallied and told Bertha her services, while undeniable, were no longer needed. Shortly after, Leona took a turn for the worse and died of severe stomach cramps and nausea. She was hired yet again to take care of 74-year-old Mary Stolfelder. Yes, from the same family where three children died in her care. And it wasn't long before Mary met the same fate as the others. The same happened to a man who worked for the Giffords named James Ogle, who complained he wasn't getting the money they owed him. He was paid just in time for a funeral. A man named S. Herman Pounds found himself drunkenly passed out in the Giffords' pasture. And after Bertha gave him a tonic to sober up, found himself with, quote, acute gastritis superinduced by alcoholism and dead before the doctor could arrive. After Herman came the sudden death of grandma Bertie Understell, with whom Bertha was visiting, and at some point, a seven-year-old victim named Mary Brown. Ed Brindley was the last of Bertha's victims and, similar to Herman, found himself resting against the mailbox outside of the Giffords' home after one too many ciders. Bertha and Eugene carried the man inside where, two hours later, he was dead. Now, despite being indicted by a grand jury, Bertha remained steadfast in her conviction, claiming she was nothing more than a nurse who had a little bit of bad luck. But when the chief of police, Andrew McConnell, took over and suggested that she had poisoned Beulah Pounds, the three-year-old daughter of victim Herman Pounds, she finally snapped. Well, anyway, I did not give any arsenic to that Pounds child. He pressed on and asked, to whom did you give it? And she quietly confessed to the murder of Ed Brindley, the two Shamel boys, and, in her own words, perhaps a few more. When asked why, she claimed she was simply putting them out of their misery. After three days of trial, Bertha Atlas Williams Graham Gifford was found guilty by reason of insanity and sent to the Missouri State Hospital, where she remained until her death on August 20th, 1951. To this day, no one knows exactly how many victims Bertha had, though the number ranges from about 15 to 17 total. And given the high mortality rates and the use of arsenic for medical purposes, it's hard to know how many she killed on purpose. Thank you for joining me in my morning cup of murder. Please join me again tomorrow to hear what terrible thing happened on August 21st. Don't forget to rate and subscribe and let me know how you like it. If you want to help support the podcast, there's always Patreon or just sharing it with your true crime obsessed friends. And remember, stay safe.